Welcome to Momentum Magnet, a podcast to inspire your growth. I'm Karen Morales, and your host in helping you find ways to make positive changes for your business, health, relationships, and life. We always have a path to a happier ending, so let's get started today. Hi, and happy Friday. Welcome to Momentum Magnet. We're here every Friday to talk about strategies for you to grow your business and add a little extra something to your life. Today's topic is one that has come up often in all of my entrepreneurial circles, and it is how the heck do you write a book? Now, most of us know that writing a book isn't always that fast lane to wealth and success. It's a hard process, but it can be the first step in a beautiful journey. And today we're diving deep with not only a published author, but also a trainer of book coaches themselves. Today, we're going to welcome Jenny Nash, and our conversation with Jenny is going to dive into all that you need to know to become a first-time author, how you secure an agent, how you write that book proposal, and how the heck do you focus yourself to start writing. Jenny Nash is the founder and the writer of How to Read Books All Day and Get Paid for It, The Business of Book Coaching. The author accelerator that she founded has trained more than 50 coaches to support writers through the entire creative process. Her own coaching clients have landed New York agents and six-figure book deals with big five houses like Penguin and Simon & Schuster. So I am really excited to welcome Jenny. Hi, Jenny. Hi, thanks for having me. Oh, I'm really excited because I got a lot of really exciting feedback about this episode. I mentioned when we were talking that I posted a question on my Instagram channel and asked people if they've ever wanted to write a book. And surprisingly, 70% of my audience said yes. That's such a high percentage. It's awesome. Well, I think when you're dealing with a lot of entrepreneurs that feel like they've created a niche for themselves and something special, it doesn't surprise me that people want to get their message out into the world. And a book is really a great way to do it. So can you help us understand how did you become a writer and now a book coach and a coach of coaches yourself? Well, it is a long journey, so I'm going to keep it short so we can get to the juicy stuff of how they can write a book. But I did start out as an author. I'm, I'm the author of nine books in three genres, and that was my path. I began to teach writing at the UCLA Writers Program. And as soon as I started to teach writing, I saw the flaws in the way that we do it. It is, the you know, the workshop sort of setting or going to a conference or this kind of ad hoc way of of writing a book doesn't often get people to where they need to go. I began to coach one of my colleagues and came up with a process and a system for helping her all the way through the creative process and all the way through the marketing and landing an agent and and a book deal. Um, That was my first client. Her name was Lisa Cron. She got a two book deal at Random House and my second client got a, a deal at Scribner and all of a sudden I was coaching people and they were knocking on my door because I had this system and this process. Then I launched Author Accelerator to train others how to do it. And, and I launched that business at when I was 50. So I'm an over 50 entrepreneur and I'm taking all my skills and talents from 30 years in the industry to to systematize this creative process that most people think is total chaos. And, you know, as you indicated, it seems like a totally overwhelming thing. How do you get from idea to finished book? And I know how. Oh, that's perfect. And I have to admit to the audience, it's something that I've always wanted to do. But most people, or like most people, I don't even know how you start. So let's start at the beginning and take people through this process in a systematic way. I think the first question I have in mind, and I think today we're going to focus our conversation more on the world of nonfiction, um, since fiction is its whole other animal. But if you're thinking about approaching a book, how do you know if your idea is good enough? 
So what you're looking for really is proof of concept, right? So it's you really want to think about it the same way a business person is going to think about a product or a new product line or a new income stream or any sort of thing that you do. You want to think through how is this idea going to function in the world? How is it going to live? What am I going to do with it? And that's the kind of thinking you want to take, that really big picture strategic thinking Because an idea itself is totally worthless. And that's something that people, you know, entrepreneurs know that you can have the best idea in the world, but unless you execute it and unless you execute it well, it doesn't matter. Somebody else can have an idea. You know, you can have another idea. So asking, is my idea good enough is is obviously the first question. But then what you want to start doing is really putting that idea to the test. And some of those questions are going to be, well, good enough for what? What's your goal? What are you trying to accomplish with this book? Do you want to become a thought leader? Do you want to become someone the press um, or media comes to? Do you want to expand your audience or your reach? You know, what are you trying to do? And that's the first thing is, what do I want out of this? So an idea can be good enough if, Let's just say that you have this thing you're burning to to write about, you're burning to do, and you don't care if it's if a bunch of people are going to buy it or if it's going to drive traffic to you or get you anything. You just want to do it. Well, that's your goal. That's so good enough is different for that type of a pro, you know product or book than it would be, for instance. I have a client who has a big speaking career and she wants to have a book she sells in the back of the room because she's getting tired of everybody saying, where's your book? (laughs) I want to buy your book. Let me give you money. She has a different goal than that, that first writer. So it's really honing in on why do you want to do it? That's a great question. So if somebody is listening and they think I have the seed of the idea, but maybe right now, I don't have a big enough audience, what comes first, build the idea or build the audience? Oh, wow. That's such a good question. So this is tied into your goal as well, because if your goal is to get an agent and a book deal in traditional publishing, and the way we want to think about that is a book that's going to be distributed on a national scale, that's going to be appeal to a wide enough audience that a big publisher is going to roll the dice and take a bet on you. More and more and more traditional publishers are looking for people that already have an audience, that have a built-in platform or way to sell this book. And if you don't have that, you're going to be at a disadvantage. Now, that's not to say that you can't sell that book. You absolutely can. And I have clients all the time with either no platform or small platforms who sell their books because they've done the hard work of honing that idea and figuring it out and placing it in the market and really, you know, positioning it well so that the publisher can see the path to selling it. So the building an audience, the the thing you don't want to do, and, and I've seen people make this mistake a lot, is they have this idea for a book and they get a couple of rejections from agents saying, come back to me when you have a platform. So when then they, that what they then start doing is they start saying, well, how big a platform? What exactly do you mean? Do I need 10,000 Twitter followers? Do I need 50,000 Instagram followers? Like, tell me what I need. And that can lead down a dangerous path because now you might be buying followers who aren't engaged in your, in your content. You might be, you know, sort of scrambling down this rabbit hole of building an audience I don't think that's a good path either. So you want to be doing them in tandem, really. And the wisdom from all the marketing, book marketing experts is give away all your content. Don't hold it back. Don't keep your cards close to your chest, which seems counterintuitive. But while you're building your book, while you're writing it, give all that content away. Be generous. Let people know what you're doing. Show them what you got. And then you're going to have, you're going to be building the audience while you're writing the book and you're going to have both things accomplished. So it's kind of a, um, they're all really tied up together, but I think it's a mistake to 
um, you know, if you've got an idea for a book and it's come into your brain and it's sparked in you and it's burning and you can't stay away from that idea, I'm a big believer in following your intuition and in following that spark. I think that's how most entrepreneurs work. You know, it like if you think about an idea that for to bring a product into the world, whether that's an object or a course or whatever, whatever it is, if you don't have that spark, it's, it's going to be hard to do all the steps that you need to, to get it done. And sometimes that spark is not necessarily the best path to follow. Like you might do a pro con list. You might look at the costs and strategies and it might look like a really bad idea, but you want to do it anyway. I mean, the world is full of success stories that come from that. So I'm a big believer. If you're burning to write a book right now, there's a reason that it's happening right now. And there's a reason that maybe that book is going to be the gateway to the other things or to the audience you want to build or to the business you want to have. So I'm a big believer in following that spark if if you have it. What percentage of the people that you work with or your coaches work with actually start with an agent or do they start with writing the book? So in the world of nonfiction, there is a very strong t- tr- tradition of selling the book before you write it. And but that's not exactly what most people think it sounds like. What what it is is you do a book proposal. You develop a book proposal. And the way to think of a proposal is it's like a business plan for your book. And my clients' proposals are in the neighborhood of 50 to 70 pages. They're very robust. So yeah, she's oh, got whoa. a look on her face of like, well, hold up. Okay. Okay. Let's, let's stop there. Cause you just <laughs> blew my mind. I'm picturing a, a book proposal is, you know, a few pages in like a PowerPoint, almost like a first round VC presentation. Okay. So this is a really important point. Um, I just, I just had a client who came to me on the recommendation through an agent. An agent came to me and said, will you work with this writer? And she had done exactly what you're talking about. And I don't want to say her name because I'm not going to throw her under the bus. But she had a big Instagram following. She had a great idea. She literally had a page and a half proposal that she sent to this agent. And this agent, this is not normally going to happen, but this agent said, this is a great idea. This is a terrible proposal. You need to go, go fix it up and then come back to me. So this writer came to me and we, and we did the work, which I can talk about what the work is and built this proposal. I, I think hers was in the 70, 70 page range, um, sent it back to the agent, the agent signed her. They're out on submission with that proposal right now. So that proposal will go to a publisher and the publisher will give an advance for that book. So now that writer is being paid to write the book, which is the dream. So most nonfiction books are sold in this way. There are certain nonfiction books, depending on the topic, depending on the writer, where you would want to write the whole book out. Some of those would be something that's very heavy uh, memoir you know, story based, you would probably want to write the whole manuscript first, but you also want to do a proposal. And um, if the writer is, I don't know, there's, there's a lot of different criteria you would make this decision on. Um, If they're not as well known, if they don't have as big a platform, if they're really making a controversial point, that kind of thing, you might want to write the whole thing first, but Most of the time you don't want to do that because what tends to happen is an agent is going to want to tweak that proposal once they get it. And then the publisher is going to want to tweak how things go once they get it. And if you have a 300 page manuscript, it's much more painful to do that tweaking. I can give you a quick example of, of what this tweaking looks like. Uh, I worked with a client this year who was a journalist, an on-air television journalist, and she was writing a personal story that had to also do with the state of journalism in in the world. Her personal story happened to be extremely dramatic because she was writing about her mother's murder. So it was 20 years ago, and she finally felt ready to write it. And so she put together this proposal. That's what we did. 
Now, there was a question in her story about how much to lean into the idea of faith, because in her journey, she lost her faith in God, and then she got it back. So how much did she want this story to be a faith story? There are um, agents who specialize in faith-based books. There's massive Christian publishers that specialize in those kind of books. She could have made the decision to take her book in that direction or not. So she cho- chose not to. So we went out to mainstream agents with this story and we started to get some feedback that they were interested in the faith-based aspect as well. And so she tweaked the proposal and then she landed an agent. She happened to land her number one top dream agent. And sure enough, that agent said, I want to I want to change this proposal so that it's really brings that faith-based element out before we go out on submission. So that's what she's actually doing that work right now. And then when it lands with whoever it ends up landing with and that publisher gives her a book deal, they may take it even further or take it in a different direction or tweak it or, or sort of massage it. So the, um, the book proposal that you're going out to the agent with is I always say it has to be good enough It has to be good enough, but it's not, um, not finished, but that's the process. And I'll, I'll let you respond to that. And then we can talk about why is the book proposal 70 pages? (laughs) Yeah. I mean, the whole time I'm sitting here thinking, wow, it's like a fully baked business plan for a startup enterprise where you figured out all elements of operations, finances, staffing, product sourcing, And I had no idea until this moment, it was such an intricate process. So I think let's talk a little bit about that proposal. And then maybe we can circle back to examples of types of ideas that were ready to go through that process, which is, I believe, a little more intense than people might think. Yeah. And the way that you're characterizing it is exactly right. So a book proposal is... You're going to be presenting who your audience is. It, you know, you're going to analyze that audience. How big is it? Where can you find them? What are they looking for uh, from this book? So we're going to do audience segmentation. Then we're going to do a competitive title analysis. So that's going to be what else is out there like it? What are these ideal readers reading? What is the market like for this book? Who's, who's doing what in it? And that comp title analysis is is always fascinating because you're looking for kind of a Venn diagram of where the book is going to sit, what audience is it going to cross. It's, it's, you know, a lot of books can kind of sit on different shelves in the bookstore. Um, if you think of a book like, oh, let's just take a book a lot of people read, um, Cheryl Strayed's Wild. Yep. That that book could sit on the travel bookshelf. It could sit on the adventure travel bookshelf. It could sit in memoir. It could sit in self-help and healing. You know, it could sit in a lot of places. And so the work that we're doing is really positioning. We're we're positioning the book. So those are sections that are going to be in the proposal. You're going to have an author bio section that's not just your resume, but why are you the best person to write this book? What is, what are you bringing to the table to, to be the authority to write this book? Then you're going to have an annotated table of contents. And this is by far the hardest part of the proposal because you're envisioning the entire book. You're envisioning what every chapter is going to look like. What's going to be in each chapter. Is there going to be a repetitive element in each chapter whether that's an inspiring quote at the top or a checklist at the end. Are you going to be including studies, interviews, other voices? You know, how, what's the mix going to be in it? So we shape and structure the entire book. And then the bulk of the proposal is sample chapters. So you really present often two sample chapters and they should be fully fleshed out They should be showcasing your voice and your style and how you're going to approach this topic. You know, it's really the, where the proof of concept comes for, for the agents and publishers. The whole beginning of the proposal is the argument. And then, you know, here it is, can this writer pull it off? 
So that's, that's how you get to those 50 to 70 pages. And the work of figuring out all that out also involves to your, to your previous point, where, why am I doing this? Where is it fitting in my business? How do I want to be out in the world with it? There's a big marketing section. And, and when I'm working with a client on the marketing section, we're talking about, are you going to be out on the speaking circuit? What's your keynote going to be? Are you going to be doing breakout sessions? Are you going to speak at conferences? Are you going to speak at schools? Are you going to speak at trade associations? How, how are you going to literally be in the world with your book? What about blog tours? Where are you going to appear? Are you going to write guest posts? Are you going to write other articles? Are you going to produce content on YouTube? You can do a podcast. You know, what, how are you, how is this book going to live in the world? So we're really looking then at the writer's career and what do they want this book to do for them, to be for them. So it, at least the way that I coach it, it's, it's big conversations. <laughs> That's really interesting. How long does that process usually take to walk somebody through that? I'm thinking this is a six month to a year engagement. So I, I do it in two different ways. Uh, six months is exactly right. That's what a typical engagement is. If somebody's coming from zero and we're going all the way to the pitch, including researching agents and getting the strategy ready, it's, it's a six month process. And typically with a deadline twice a month and, and the writers producing content for every deadline and coming back to me with it. But recently I uh, just because of the demand of my clients, I, I have a lot of clients come to me that, that need this proposal tomorrow, um, whether they've got an agent asking for it, a publisher asking for it, they might already, I might already have a book and they, they want to do a second book and they, they want it fast. Um, so I have been in the last probably five, five or six months testing a compressed version of that, where we do the whole thing in about four weeks. Um, and it's, I mean, it's like clear your calendar. You're going to be doing five hours a day, especially in the first week, we have a deadline every day and, they have to produce a lot of work, do a lot of research, do a lot of thinking. And um, I've been testing that concept to see how it works. And it's been so much fun. Um, You have to be the right kind of person for sure. And you have to be able to clear your schedule for sure. But how much fun is it to, it's like a forge. It's like this fire and we're just in it. And, you know, my job as the coach is to just, I'm just poking holes in the idea. I'm just pressing them and pushing them. And well, what about this? And how come not that? And why not this other thing? And I hear you saying this and like holding a mirror up to what they really want to say. And that compressed intense time frame has proved to be fantastically effective. And, and it's, when I say it's so much fun, it's, I mean, some of the, of the five people that I've tested with, well, first of all, four of them have gotten agents. So that's nuts. Um, the, the success rate, but every single one of them has at one point in that first week, uh, cried. So (laughs) it is not, it is not for the meek of heart, the way that, that I do it. But I, I've done this. You've got the Navy SEAL boot camp. I mean, that's like the Navy SEAL boot camp. (laughs) You know, I talk about tough love and people are like, yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's the tough part is, is I just have been doing this so long that I know what makes a book good is when you get down to that authentic, raw thing that's driving you. And this is true. I don't care what the topic is that I work with people on such a broad range of topics. It, it doesn't matter what the topic is. You've got to get down to that heart, soul level thing. Like, why is this book calling to you? What makes you angry? What makes you fired up? Why are you so passionate about this thing? Because that's what people are buying. They're coming to books. I mean, you know, as a reader, this happens to me all the time where I'm, you know, I'm reading a book and I'm just like, Ah, oh, this is just exactly what I needed at this exact moment. I want to tell all my friends, I want to make them all read it. And 
this author, like, I love this person. They're my best friend. And because they saw me, right. They saw me. So I can give a silly example. I recently read uh, Marie Kondo's um, The Life-Changing Magic of Tidying Up. And I'm laughing because it's sold the, on the cover of my copy. It says 9 million copies. Like, I'm the last person on earth to read this book. And I, and I read it because I have a client that keeps referencing it. She's, she's not writing about the home making or cleaning up at all. She's writing something about food, actually. But she keeps referencing it. So I'm like, all right, I got to read the book. So I'm reading the book. And I used to stink and love this book. It's so fabulous. It's, it's so ballsy. Like everything about it is just amazing. And this great voice, this great, you know, structure. I'm just a junkie for a great structure. This great message. Just everything about it is so good. And, and, and then you get to the end and there's this deep message that she's been pulling you through the whole book. And this deep message is about knowing your heart and knowing your self and, and giving into what you actually desire and being able to name that and doing that through this relationship with these objects in your house. But I, it, I, it's just hilarious because I was telling everybody, you have to read this book. And everyone's like, Jenny, I read that book five years ago. <laughs> you know, but that feeling that you get when like, ah, oh, this is just so good. That doesn't come from nothing. That comes from the writer having tapped into that True. place, right? Right. And I mean, it's the same in marketing for any power brand. I mean, I think the beauty of Marie Kondo is that it's become part of our vernacular. I mean, I've used that language with my friends on everything from a marriage to a piece of clothing. Like, does it bring you joy? Yeah. I mean, I literally quoted that line when it came to major life and small life decisions. And what's so great is I was the same way as you. I was using that even though I hadn't read the book. Like it was, it's so knowable. It's so actionable. It's so great. And I'm like, yeah, you know, I read articles, whatever. But when you read the book, you're like, oh, this is really actually profound. This does it bring you joy thing. This is about self-worth. This is about self-knowledge. Like this is, this is everything. And I don't know the process by which Marie Kondo wrote that book, but there is some process she went through, whether it was in her own self or, or not that got her to be able to put that on the page. And that's the work. So that's why I was saying having an idea, you know, having an audience, those are, those are, we have to talk about those things, but ultimately what we're doing is we're trying to pin to the page this deep level belief or philosophy that the writer has. And the reason I love my work so much is I get to work with people who have this massive passion for whatever it is, whatever their thing is, and that they have this burning desire to spread that passion and, and share it. And that's, what's so cool about this. So if you're, feeling that pull or feeling that call or that yearning. Because when you think about it, there's a lot of other things you could do with your energy and your time. If you're, a, if you're an entrepreneur, you, you're busy. Um, or in, you know, your free time, you could garden, you could play tennis, you could learn how to make a killer roast chicken. Like there's a lot of things you could do that are not soul work. And, and if you're called to write a book, I think you're called to do that and, and called to spread it. You know, a book is a thing that lives in the world when other people read it, but you have to have a reader to close the loop. So being called to write a book is, is being called to do that. I think when I look back at some really challenging moments in my life and I, I was diagnosed with a very rare muscular disease when I was 20 and there was no information. There still really is no information of the world in the world of someone having a positive outcome, right? Wow. It didn't exist. And I looked for it. I also remember when I was going through my separation and my divorce, I was looking for resources that also didn't exist. There was a lot of lack of 
informative sources that talked about how to make the decision in a way that I felt wasn't faith-based. There was a lot of information about how to make it work, but there wasn't a lot of information um, on how to make yourself strong enough to look at it as an opportunity to transform every item in your life. And I think especially as a woman, one of the most interesting chasms that I saw in that pivotal moment was there were no entrepreneurial books that really said a a woman getting divorced could actually be the world's best business owner. And I had a lot of points of tension in that, in that moment in time, because people were like, this is not your moment to go do something risky. And I'm like, actually, it absolutely is. (laughs) (laughs) So what's so cool about that, that thought process you went through, it's exactly the process that, that this book proposal intensive thing that I do is about, because what you're doing, if you think about it, is you're saying there's books on this, there's books on this other thing, there's books that touch on that. You can get two books that do this thing I want to do or, but there's not one that does this exact thing. And, you know, the thing that we talk about a lot in my work is, okay, somebody going through a divorce, you're going to buy all the books. Like you're going to have 10 books. You're going to have 12 books. You might not even read all the books. You're going to buy all the books, but you're, you want, you don't just buy one. You know, it's the same thing with somebody going on a trip to Italy. You don't just buy one book, right? Or you buy all the things. So uh, a reader is looking for a lot of different information. They're looking for a lot of different voices, a lot of different things around this. There's so much room in whatever category you're, you're in to do this very specific thing and to bring together I think the best books bring together multiple um, sort of perspectives or multiple ideas. Um, I, I am thinking of a client of mine and just such a great example. She's a physician and she also is a Jewish woman who bakes challah every Friday. And she has in her estimation made a thousand challahs by the time we were working. And She's a mother and she is a wellness expert. And and she came to believe that making hala every Friday was more healing to her than all the other self-care wellness things. So she wanted to write this book about baking bread, taking care of herself, being a mom, you know, being Jewish, being a doctor, like all these threads and wanted to bring them together in a, in a book. Now you can imagine what a hot mess that would be if you didn't do some intentional work around. I'm seeing it right now because I know in my small suburb in Massachusetts, where it's a lot colder than it is where you are in California, we could not keep flour on the shelves because all of my friends were baking bread. Like they owned patisserie (laughs) bake shops. I mean, these women who have Pelotons and probably don't eat carbs were buying 50 pound bags of flour and became like King Arthur's bake shop all quarantine. Now, the craziest part of these of these women, Lindsay, you know, I'm talking to you. They didn't even gain any weight. Like, I don't even understand. Mm -hmm. She's baking bread left and right. And she's, you know, not even a pound about heavier, but I get it. There was a therapeutic moment during quarantine where the bread bakers among us did it as if it was going to save their lives and keep their sanity. So this goes back I to your, your comment about audience. So yeah. Beth, uh, Beth Riccanati is the author of this book. She actually wrote this book before the pandemic and won a ton of awards and she was building an audience for it. She had a great Instagram So when the pandemic hit, she was instantly doing virtual kala making events for groups of women, temples, even churches, like how cool is that, all over the world. And she suddenly had this booming 
thing that was about her career, it was about her speaking practice, it was about all these different things. And she was primed to speak to her audience and to gather it. And she grew it enormously. And in that process, she had she actually self published the first book uh, with a hybrid publisher. And a traditional publisher has approached her saying, let's do another book like this is so fantastic. This is such a thing. And it's just this weird sort of combination of of things. Um, She calls it part memoir, part manifesto, and part cookbook. <laughs> you know, so that's, that. that, those books tend to, books like, like that's an extreme example, but they tend to just be really resonant because we're all bringing together things every day, parts of us and trying to figure things out, you know, trying to live our best lives, all the things. And, um, you know, even the Marie Kondo book we were mentioning, it's not just about tidying up it's about these other things too and so that doing this deep work of what am I really saying when who am I really saying it to and why do they care why do I care doing all this work is what gets you to a great book that's interesting and I think it's so resonant for a lot of my clients we've been pitching um a few of our CEOs who are, you know, well-known and have received awards for TED Talks and other sort of large-scale keynote um, speeches. And I find sometimes you're trying out different proposals to see what lands and you're trying different talk tracks to see what gets the best notoriety and emotional response from the audience. Because given that I'm in marketing, you're in book writing, you always want an evocative response, right? Those are the types of things that land well and continue on in perpetuity, build the momentum. But one of the things I'm thinking right now that would be such an amazing experience for a lot of people that have this tingling in the back of their head is how do you start thinking ahead of the book and beginning to prove in life and in speeches, it's your beta testing, right? If you were going to create a product. So is there a shortened process that you could point people to where they start thinking ahead of this book that they could write in the future and testing it out? Absolutely. I mean, the most basic level would be if you're writing a newsletter or a blog or some sort of um, regular thing that you make. It could also be a podcast. It could be a YouTube channel, it could be anything, but you're putting content out. Then, you know, as a marketer, what you're doing is looking at what content to your point connects and lands, what gets engagement, what are people wanting more of? What are they excited about? Actually exactly what you're doing right now. Look, my audience is interested in book writing. You know, you, you, you saw that and you did something about it. So I think it's the same thing as you look at what, what topics or ways of getting at the topic are um, the most resonant for my audience, getting the most engagement, getting the most interest and, and following those, those threads and, and just kind of going further down that path and more into that. And what ideas are sticking that I think that's the best way of thinking about it. A really excellent example of this is my friend Jess Leahy is the author of The Gift of Failure, which is probably one of the all-time best-selling parenting books of all times. It sold just massive numbers of copies, and she has become a enormously popular and well-paid writer. Uh, she's about to come out with her next book, actually, um, but the um, that first book, The Gift of Failure, happened because she wrote a piece for, I believe it was the New York Times, that just went viral. It just like, you know, she's a, a columnist. She's a writer. She writes these types of pieces all the time. She's a teacher. She was writing in around this I, these ideas all the time. But this one called The Gift of Failure just like caught on like wildfire and I think she told me, I'm probably getting this wrong, but the spirit of it is right. I think within six weeks or eight weeks of of that article, she had a book deal. So she, you know, hit on the thing, like the, the way of saying it, the phrasing, the, 
the you know emotional um, truth she hit on it that that struck a chord and and then that was the book now that doesn't happen in quite so dramatic a way for the rest of us but I think it's it's really what we're talking about is finding your voice finding the thing that you would get up on a soapbox and talk about for three years you know you're talking about it through a TED talk or through that and it's kind of you know you're tweaking and you're positioning and you're looking and it's all about what do I say and how do I say it that is my thing that's not other people's thing but it's it's really me in the way that I say it and that I feel powerful saying it and that other people hear me like I'm having an impact it's it's looking for that and so I like to think about having your antenna out you know like um what's the story what's the turn of phrase you know sometimes it's just this turn of phrase not that turn of phrase that that's just like the thing you let you land on it when you get those words right you get that way of saying it right and sometimes it's more of a an ongoing um practice I guess you might say you know I can talk about my own my own experience with this it's because it's very interesting I write a weekly newsletter and it is totally not strategic the way I know it should be. And I sort of write whatever. And I usually write it like the night before and, you know, all so that. So do I. Right? I do. <laughs> yep. Right? And, and mostly I was writing about writing. That's what I help people with. So I'm doing craft things. And I would sometimes do these very elaborate craft things with, with examples. And I would pull text and I would annotate it, you know, and I was doing all the stuff. It was taking me a ton of time and, I have a great open rate. I have a great follow rate. I have a great all that. But then I would write something like that. It'd be 10 o'clock the night before my, my blog deadline was due, my newsletter deadline was due. And I whip something off about my daughter's getting married, you know, and something. And I would sort of bring it around at the end, some writing related thing. It was kind of like a Hail Mary pass, you know, and what would happen is people just loved those posts and they would write to me and they would share it with people. And, and at first I was mad and I was like, what is their problem? Like I'm offering all this amazing content and what they care about is this dumb thing I wrote about my daughter's wedding. But what I realized over time is that it's that personal lens, that that specific way that I have of looking at story, of looking at writers, of looking at the world that is what people really want. So I stopped writing the craft things and I started drilling down more into that. And then la- that leads me into talking more about these these bigger ideas of creativity, of finding your voice, of taking up space in the world for women of asking for what you're worth. Like it's led me down this different ish path. It's still the same sandbox, but those metaphors don't work. There's not paths in sandbox. Maybe there are, I don't know, but um, do you know what I mean? So it's, it's honing that thing that the people who listen to you and the people you're serving want from you. And sometimes they want from you, something different than they want from me, even though we might be talking about the exact same thing. So it's paying attention to your voice in the world, to the stories you tell in the world, to the things that people respond to. And that is really about honoring. And that's that's how you find your tribe, right? We talk a lot of times about brands having an authentic voice and having a tone and a way of being. But even uh, something as simple as last night was a friend's birthday and we did a birthday Peloton ride. She picked her favorite instructor. Person's not my jam. I hated every second of it. I wanted to get off that bike. Didn't didn't resonate with me. She was thrilled. She thought the music was incredible. She felt inspired. She got a personal record. I wanted to run. And and I think that's the same with writing, right? Your Your favorite book could be my nightmare. I mean, when we share authors' voices or we listen to keynote speakers, sometimes some of the world's most famous speakers don't appeal to you. And that's fine. That's the point, right? You can have so many 
so many different flares on the same message because it's going to land on people's ears differently. I once worked with this writer who booked a strategy session with me. And so that included sending some stuff in advance about what he was thinking about writing. And I was reading through his stuff and I was just thinking, this is so dull. It is so boring. I'm only reading a few pages about the book and I don't even want to read this book. Like, it's just like, it's just bad. And so we get on the phone first time we've ever spoken. And I said to this guy, um, I get the feeling you don't really want to write this book. Like your heart's not really in this book. And it was a leadership an executive leadership thing. And, and he, and he like practically burst into tears. It was like the first 30 seconds. <laughs> and he said, how did you know? And I was like, Cause you pretty much told me like you pretty much <laughs> wrote it down, right? Like this is not rocket science. And, and he said, I don't want to write this book. And, and I said, well, why are you even trying to write this book? Why are you even having this conversation? And, and he said, well, because I'm really good friends with this famous author whose name I won't say and famous author really thinks I should write this book. Like it'd be a big deal and famous author can help me and da da da. And I was like, okay, but if you don't want to write this book, you're going to be tortured. Your readers mm-hmm. are going to hate it. Like, why are you doing this? And, and then I said, is there another book that you're wanting to write? Cause he's paying a lot of money to come to me. You don't go to a book coach because you have a book you don't want to write. Right. So, so I asked him, is there something else that you want to write? And he, and he, he said, yeah, but I'm embarrassed to say what it is. And I'm like, you don't know me. Like, just tell me. I don't care. And he said, I'm a, a single parent. I'm a, a gay man. I have twins. I want to write a book about gay single parenting of twins. And I'm like, can you imagine how happy all the other people in that boat or adjacent to that boat will be if you write that book? Like, like, and he was like, starts reeling off what he's going to put in it, what the TOC is going to be like the funny tone he's going to have this whole, and it was just like, that's that, your book. That's your book. Like don't write this executive leadership thing. You don't want to write, write that book, you know? So it's, that's, that was an extremely dramatic example of coming to your thing. I think he, I think he absolutely knew that, that he was going to land there. I think it just, so happened, it happened fast and in this sort of spectacular way. But um, that process is what a lot of book writers do go through. And so I think that's the process to pay attention to is what do I really want to write? Why do I really want to write it? What is it going to do for me? Is it going to be fun? Is it going to be resonant for people? Are people, I, I bet that guy has been out in the world talking about this topic and getting really good feedback on it already right so it's it's living in the world with your best ideas and you know a mistake a lot of me people make is is they don't want to share their idea they think it's going to get stolen this is kind of this myth um and sometimes people are saying you know I don't want to work with a book coach because you're going to steal my idea it's like I am not going to steal your idea I don't want your idea you know that's not the way it works and but people who have that mistake and understanding of ideas think that an idea is like a patent on a mechanical thing that you know I, I don't know I'm not coming up with something but like the person who figured you could out write a, a, a parenting book for twins in 50 different voices including the one we just discussed so a thousand, it's different, voices. A thousand different voices it's like you could have a thousand different transportation companies they're not right. all going to be uber right. you can have i mean there's a, there's always i mean we talk a lot about competition is limitless like you should not be thinking about your competition because if you've positioned yourself in an empty space there is none right Right. And when it comes to a book, what people are buying is your approach to it. And that's what I was trying to say earlier about my finding my own voice with my audience and who I'm speaking to. It's finding your own way of talking about that topic. You know, it just turns out I could talk about craft all day long. I know a lot about it. I'm good at it. I teach it. But 
it's not my thing. I don't want to be known for craft. People don't come to me for craft. So, you know, it's finding what your jam is. And that's a combination of people's reaction to it and your experience of delivering it. And if you don't deliver it, if you're not out in the world talking about it, you're not going to get the experience of what people think. So that mistake of, well, I'm not going to tell anybody because somebody is going to steal my idea. Or if I tell, give away too much, they'll never buy my book. You know, famous examples of authors to whom this does not happen would be um, like Seth Godin in your, in your space, a permission marketing guy. I think he's written 19 books and he gives it all away on his blog. You can just go get it all. It's all there. It's like all the content, all the wisdom, all the stuff. He repackages it in, in these books that sell gazillions of copies because people want both. They, they want the different formats. A book is a thing you can hold in your hand. You can turn the corner of the page down. You can underline. So they'll consume it on the blog while it's, whipping by and then they'll buy the book. Another well-known example is Daniel Pink does this um, work as well, where, you know, his, he sells and marketing stuff. He gives away all the stuff and then sells a book. So, you know, people are afraid of that, but the, the marketing experts absolutely say that it doesn't hurt an author to, to give their stuff away. So no, being- the value exchange is important in any brand. So we are getting close to time and I want to recap for people the process they can take today based on all of the amazing wisdom that you gave us and then how we can they can keep in touch with you. So the first step is to really define that burning desire, your goal and your message that you're trying to deliver. Then you want to get very clear about the audiences you serve and where it fits within the shelf space of a bookstore. So where would this play and who would it appeal to? And then you want to try some trial chapters and really look at that table of contents to sort of start building out this test. And then, like we talked about, put that content into the wild. Publish it, say it, speak it, blog it, podcast it, share it, so that you know that it's landing. Now, for people listening today and thinking, wow, in 2020 and working from home, reading people's ideas for books and helping them write them might be my dream job. Can you talk a little bit about how you train book coaches and how aspiring writers can get in touch with you? And then in the speaker's note, Jenny and I had a great idea at the beginning of this podcast. We haven't taken the idea to fruition yet, but we will be doing a webinar soon to really dive deep in these topics. And we'll make sure that anyone that uh, subscribes and signs up after listening to this podcast gets an invitation. So go ahead and talk about working with you. So if somebody's interested in finding some tips and steps and, and prompts and things for starting a book idea, I think the best place to go would be to JennyNash.com. That's J E N N I E. NASH.com. And I have a top 10 tips and there's a ton of stuff in there. You can grab downloads and free courses and all kinds of things that walk you through this process I've talked about. If you're interested in working with a book coach, authoraccelerator.com has, we do a free matching where we will match you with a coach who is working in your topic or genre or style Um, And we do that matching for free and there's no obligation. We just say, here's a coach that would be, we think would be good for you who is taking writers and you can decide if you want to work with them. Sometimes just the process of filling out our form is helpful for people because it asks you questions about your book and you're like, I don't know. And then people have told me all the time, that form is so hard. It scared me off. And I said, yeah, that's the point. Um, (laughs) You want to know, you want to know what you're doing, at least in the wheelhouse of what you're doing, if you're going to be paying for help. And then if somebody is interested in becoming a book coach and adding that as a side gig or an income stream for helping their clients bring their ideas to life, you can go to bookcoaches.com. That's where our training and certification program lives. And I've got a six part series on what book coaching is and how it works and how you can make money. That's at bookcoaching.com backslash ABC for about. 
book coaching. So bookcoaching.com backslash ABC has that free video series. They're 30 minutes each. You'll be sick of me by the end, but it answers all your questions about uh, this training and what this work is like. I, you can tell, I just think it's amazing work. I find it incredibly satisfying, soulful, fun, and sustaining work. And we teach our book coaches how to run good businesses. Well, this sounds really exciting. And if you jump on over to Jenny's site, because it is full of step-by-step instructions on how to write a book, I look forward to putting this to work for myself, a few of my clients that I know have beautiful ideas inside their souls. And I look forward to collaborating with you more. I mean, we could have talked for another three hours. So next time, maybe we'll, we'll answer the top 10 or 20 questions that people have um, when they're pondering getting into the actual writing itself. But I want to thank you and let everyone know that we're here every Friday. Momentum Magnet will is dedicated to giving you tips and tricks to build more momentum in your life and business. Every week we meet with an expert to help you get smarter about a topic that you can put to work today to help yourself improve. We love to see your reviews, get your comments, and have you subscribe on iTunes, Spotify, Pandora, and iHeartRadio. It helps us create our reach, secure guests that you're interested in, and make sure that we're creating content that really helps you move forward. So make sure you go over there and subscribe. Um, And If you have any feedback, please send me an email at karen at marketing-magnet.com. We help businesses of all sizes create momentum by giving you outsourced teams to solve your hardest marketing challenges. That wraps up today's episode of Momentum Magnet. Thanks, Jenny Nash. It was wonderful to speak with you. And best of luck, everyone, in writing your next bestseller. Thank you for listening to Momentum Magnet. We're here every Friday at 1 p.m. Eastern time to share inspiring comeback stories. We want to hear your reviews and love getting your subscriptions on iTunes and Spotify. For show notes and past episodes, visit MomentumMagnet.com. I'm Karen Morales, keynote speaker, writer, and founder and CEO of Marketing Magnet, a fast-growing marketing agency for purpose-driven companies. Whether you are a business needing an agency or if you are looking for weekly tips to get ahead, sign up at marketing-magnet.com to receive our weekly inspiration on getting more in your life and business.